Welcome to the Sterling Dash Replacement Installation Video. To remove your old dash, you'll need the following tools. An 8mm socket with a torque driver, a Phillips head screwdriver, a punch, a hammer, radio removal keys, a 14mm spanner and a pair of multi-grips. A few other tools will be required later on to prepare and install the new dash. The first task is to remove the old dash. The initial step in this process is to remove the fuse box cover, then remove the panel below the fuse box using your Phillips screwdriver. Once this panel is off, you can remove the screws holding the fuse box in place. It can then hang out of the way. Step two is to remove the steering column cover using your screwdriver to remove the five screws. The next step is to take off the central panel where your air brake controls, radio, aircon controls and ancillary gauges are located. This panel is often the most damaged on older Stirling. Once all the screws are out, you can unscrew and remove your park brake switch, which then gives you access so that you can use the punch and hammer to knock out the pin holding the trailer brake switch on. This can be a little fiddly. Once that's off, we tackle the radio, using radio removal keys for the model of the radio that's installed in your truck. Once it's out, you can disconnect the radio wiring harness. Then you'll be able to remove the central panel and lay it out of the way. The wiring and air lines should be long enough to allow you to get in behind it and start unplugging the various components. As there are quite a few of these, it's a good idea to label the wires so you know which is which. That makes putting things back together a lot easier. We've just used some masking tape and texture. When you have all those connections out of the way, it's time to unscrew the locking nut and remove the trailer brake switch. Then we remove the locks on the park brake switch. Now try and keep this as a single unit so you know how it goes back together. That will release your park brake. In step four, we remove the AC control unit. Once these four screws have been removed, you can start taking the unit out, but you'll have to disconnect the main air supply line, which comes in at the top, and feed that back through the dash. Now 
Then there are a couple of plugs to be disconnected. They can be a bit tight, so you may need to use a screwdriver to help you flick them off. Then on the right side, you'll find a series of six vacuum lines, which need to be released. These are color coded, so you don't need to mark them. At the back, there's a switch which needs to be disconnected. This can be quite tight. Then you can remove the AC control unit from the dash. Next up, we remove the four screws holding the retaining plate in place so that we can take it out and push the switches back through the dash out of the way. Step number five is to remove the two air vents using the screwdriver to carefully pry them out of the surrounds. Be gentle or you could break them. With that little task out of the way, you can then undo the four bolts holding the steering column in place. Lift it up and out and lay it down on the seat. The sixth step in removing your existing dash is to take out the main instrument panel. First, you'll need to remove the trailer brake handle, which should come off easily. Then, remove the screws holding the cover for the instrument panel in place. This panel is broken, as many of the old Stirling dash panels often are. When those are out and it's loose, you can unplug the headlight switch and remove the instrument panel cover. With that out of the way, we move on to taking out the six screws which hold the actual instrument panel itself in place. When the screws are out, you can get in behind and unplug the various instrument connections to release the instrument cluster. You may need a screwdriver for this. Then use your 14mm spanner to release the oil line. You can then disconnect the various lines to your gauges. You should exercise some care here as there will be air pressure in some of these. Because of that, and the age of the setup, they can be difficult to loosen. Once you've gotten them off and released the air pressure, you can remove the entire instrument panel cluster. Next up, we whip out the four screws holding the surround for the trailer brake. And remove the locking nut holding the ignition switch to the panel. There's also a screw below that holds the ignition switch assembly itself in place. There's one more task in this phase, and that's to remove the ashtray and disconnect the cigarette lighter wiring. There are plugs which should come off relatively easily. Now we're ready to move on to getting the whole dash out of the cab. 
Step seven is to unscrew all the screws holding the dash itself in place using your eight mil socket. So get ready for a fair bit of fast forwarding. Our advice would be to undo all the bolts at the bottom first, letting the top ones hold the dash in place until you're ready. Once you've taken care of all the screws at the bottom and the sides of the dash, there are still five more to go along the top. And there's the last one. Right. Now's where you'll need a second set of hands. Lift the dash up and out, making sure all the wiring releases. Roll it over and move it out of the cab. Okay, now that the old dash is out, it's time to prepare the new dash. In terms of tools required for this section, you'll need a Dremel tool or similar, a felt tip pen or thin texter, a cordless drill, a cone drill bit, an impact driver and a file. While sterling dash replacements, new dash frames and panels are moulded directly from original sterling dashes, there are always going to be some minor differences from truck to truck. For example, your radio may have been installed in a different position. Your truck may not have a cigarette lighter or additional gauges may have been added. So we need to directly compare your old dash panels with the new ones and see if we need to make any adjustments to ensure everything fits perfectly. Our dash had a cigarette lighter, so we need to create a hole for that. Then we check that the lighter module fits and screw the back of it in place. Up next is installing the base unit for the ash truck. We use the unit itself to pre-mark where the holes need to be drilled. Then we pre-drill those holes. Now it's important to pre-drill rather than just sticking self-tapping screws in because even though the fiberglass is a lot tougher than the plastic of the original dash, there's still a chance that you could crack the fiberglass if you try sticking a screw straight in without pre-drilling. Our next task is to compare the sizing and placement of the holes for the base plate that holds the radio, trailer brake switch and park brake switch. Again, there can be variation here depending on how the dash for your sterling has been originally set up and installed. Trace the holes with your texter to mark any additional fiberglass areas that need to be cut out or trimmed. We'll hit the edges around the radio space with a file to take off a couple of mils and use our Dremel tool to expand the existing hole for the park brake switch. After that, we need to cut some holes for your air brake hoses and controls, air con hoses and ancillary gauges to feed through. Have a look on your old dash to see where these holes should be. Again, the position of these will vary somewhat depending upon your sterling and when and how certain components were originally installed. We've hit these with a drill and then used a Dremel or reciprocating saw to expand the holes where necessary. Next up, we mark up and pre-drill the holes where the screws go to hold the park brake switch in place and the holes where the radio unit holder is located. 
And finally, we mark up and pre-drill the holes for the trailer brake assembly using the Dremel tool to route out the slot for the trailer brake lever. Installing your new Stirling dash replacement is pretty much the reverse of the process you used to remove the old one. It can be a bit fiddly, but time and patience will get the job done. Maneuver the dash into place and roll it over into position. It will take a bit of jiggling to get everything into position and lined up and to get the various wires and cables back through the appropriate holes. Once all that is in place, you can start locking it into position. This time, we begin by putting the top screws into place first, just to hold the dash in place. We need to pre-drill a couple of holes here for the end brace. These can be screwed in tightly, but with all the screws and bolts in this exercise, don't over tighten them. There's another bracing point in here, behind the fuse box. You'll need to drill a hole through to mark it, and then tidy it up from the other side before putting the screw in. Next, you can put your fuse box back in. Fingers crossed, it'll pop straight back in. If not, you might need to file a mill or two off here and there. We're using a reciprocating saw, but you could also do this with a Dremel style tool or a hand file. Once everything fits perfectly, we pre-drill some pilot holes for the self-tapping screws that hold the fuse box to the dash. Remember, don't just stick the screws straight in without pre-drilling, or you could damage the fiberglass. We'll put the top screws in first to hold it in place, then pre-drill the holes at the bottom. And again, you don't need to over-tighten the screws, just do them up firmly. Next, we need to mark up and pre-drill a couple of holes to hold the panel below the fuse box. And there we go, fuse box section completed. Step 3 is installing the AC unit. First we put the mounting bracket back in place. The two screws on either side which hold the bracket in place screw into the Y-shaped central stay behind the dash. It can be difficult to line up the holes because the fiberglass is thicker and stronger than the original plastic. We didn't get any film of this but if you expand the size of the oblong holes in that Y bracket at the firewall end, it will give you another three or four millimetres to play with. Once the mounting bracket is in place, you can feed the aircon wiring and pipes through. Then it's time to set up the brakes. Better get this bit right. Push the trailer brake switch back through the appropriate hole and screw on the locking nut. Then you put the park brake switch back through, connect it up to the switch and screw it on.
Now it's time to install the aircock. That means reconnecting the colour coded hoses, then plugging the wiring harness back in, before screwing the unit back into place with self tappers using the pre drilled holes. Remember, be gentle, don't over tighten. Step 4 is putting our central panel back together. To do this, we need to pull the air lines and wiring harnesses back through and into position. These are the air lines that we marked up earlier with masking tape, so we know which hose goes where. So be sure to check carefully and make sure they're in the right positions. Once they're all connected correctly, we can manoeuvre the panel back into place. Our recommendation is to insert the screws loosely at the top to begin with, holding the panel in place but giving you some leeway to move things around where required. When you're screwing the panel in place, don't overdo the tightening, just make it firm. You don't want to crack the fiberglass. Next up, you can put the trailer brake switch back on with the locking pin partially inserted. Then we're using the hammer and punch to push the pin back through. To finish off the central panel, we screw on the park brake switch and then insert the ashtray. OK, step five in our reinstallation process starts with putting the trailer brake lever surround panel back in. Next up we get to the ignition switch. Push the switch assembly back through the hole and screw the locking nut into place. So let's get this central instrument panel in. First step is to place it into position, then use your drill to pre-drill through the existing screw holes into the dash. You can then remove the panel and tidy up those guide holes. Then use your 8mm bit to enlarge a couple of locator holes. First up we have to plug in all the wiring. And use your 14mm spanner to reconnect the oil line to the oil pressure gauge. Once it's all reconnected, you can put the panel into place and start putting in the screws. With those done, you can put the instrument panel cover into place and then bung on the handle for the trailer brake lever. Your screws then go back in to lock the instrument panel cover into position. When they've all been tightened, the next stage is to put the driver's air vents back in. They should just clip straight back in. 
don't force them and make sure you have them the right way around. Step number seven is to lift the steering column back into place and use your socket to replace the four bolts that held it in position. Then we can move on to screwing the steering column cover back on. Again, start with the top screws and don't tighten them all the way up until you have them all in place in case you need to adjust things a bit. Over in the passenger footwell, we put the base panel back on under the fuse box and screw it into place with a couple of small self-tappers. This is followed by putting the fuse box cover back on and screwing it down. Now, the last and most important step is to give your new dash a good clean. Here is the new Sterling dash replacement, looking like she just drove out of the factory. So, while every Sterling truck may be set up a little differently, we hope you found this installation video helpful. Thanks for purchasing from Sterling Dash Replacement and happy trucking.